Yeah, that's quite a few. Hi guys, so welcome to today's webinar. Um, my name's Connor, I'm part of the Becoming a Doctor team. Uh, I'm just here to introduce our speaker for today, Chris Oldfield. Um, when, uh, when Chris is talking and, and when the, the webinar is going live, um, if you could use the chat feature to ask any questions about content that's on the screen currently, and you can use the question and answer feature for content that can wait till the end. So if you have questions that you don't mind waiting till the end, that Chris can go through afterwards, uh, pop those in the question and answer. And when we have a poll or a quiz, that will just pop up on your screens automatically. You don't need to leave Zoom. It's just integrated with Zoom. So Chris, if you want to introduce yourself. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, hey, my name's Chris. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a third year medic at Imperial in London. Uh, and today we're going to be doing Neuro, Neuro 2. I gave a Neuro lecture uh, a, week or two, a week or two ago. And this lecture is going to be looking a little bit more advanced stuff on top of that. Feel free to ask any question at any point. Um, just like, like I said, either in the Q&A or in the message, feel free to use either. So we're going to be looking at three different parts of, of Neuro today. Firstly, looking at embryology. Embryology is obviously a very difficult topic and it can go into loads and loads of details. So I'm just gonna try and break it down and make it as simple as possible and make sure you understand just what you have to know as opposed to going into too much detail. Next, I'm gonna be looking at blood flow in the central nervous system, uh, the circle of Willis, and then also cerebrovascular events, which basically just means strokes. And then finally, we're gonna look at neurotransmitters in more detail. So um, the main neurotransmitters that exist and then also how a, a few specific neurotransmitters are, are produced and what enzymes are used to produce them and then also how they're broken down. So three quite separate parts of neuro but we're going to go into quite a lot of detail for each bit. So firstly is embryology. Just in terms of the um, specific cell types is what we're going to look at first and there's two uh, very origin cells that they come from either the, neuro, the neuroepithelium or the neural crest. And these develop into the CNS and the PNS respectively. So the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system respectively. So this neuroepithelium, which becomes the CNS, has three main groups that it'll turn into. Neuroblasts, glioblasts, and ependymal cells. Anything that has the word blast in it tends to just mean that it's a precursor. So neuroblast will be a precursor for the neurons that you find within the central nervous system. Now, the important thing here is that the cell bodies are found within this, the central nervous system. So some of these neurons, the cell body might be in the central nervous system, but it will have axons that deviate to the peripheral nervous system. But if it has the cell body within the CNS, that will mean that it is originated from the neuroepithelium. Next, we have glioblasts. These are basically the cells in the central nervous system that help the neurons. So that's astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. I spoke in my last lecture quite a lot about uh, what the different cell types do. So if you, haven't, if you don't fully remember, then have a look at that. I think you'll have the slides if you're on the email list. And then finally is ependymal cells. Ependymal cells we also mentioned last time, and these are what line the ventricles and the central canal. And the central canal is what the spinal cord is. is um, uh, it runs within the spinal cord. So that's, that's all from the neuroepithelium. We also then have the neural crest, and this is peripheral nervous system. And this differentiates into four different cell types. Firstly, the sensory neurons of the dorsal root ganglia. Now there's lots and lots of words in neuro that can seem really complicated. Uh, dorsal root ganglia, again, can, can get quite complicated, but this is just the sensory nerves that enter posteriorly into the spinal cord. And because they're sensation, anything peripherally, um, the nerves that I'm feeling on my finger, for example, if I, if I touch my finger, the nerves that are able to feel that, they'll be peripheral nervous system nerves. And the cell bodies of those are found in what we call the dorsal root ganglion. And that is just next to the spinal cord. Next, we have post-ganglionic autonomic neurons. So autonomic means that it's something that happens automatically, such as peristalsis. It's not something that I'm actively thinking of doing. And post-ganglionic, uh, is where there's a synapse for, for autonomic neurons between your central nervous system nerve and your peripheral nervous system nerve. 
and that synapse is in what we call the ganglion. So the ones that are after the, the ganglion are going to be peripheral nervous system because they're not within the central nervous system, which is just your brain and your spinal cord. Next, we have Schwann cells, which are a specific type of cell which produce uh, myelin sheath for peripheral nervous system nerves. And finally, there are a few other cell types that come from, from this. For example, melanocytes. Um, melanocytes are the cells that produce melanin, and these are found within your skin, and that's what gives your skin uh, colour. So that's looking at the specific cell types. Next, we're going to look at the, the brain and look on a, a bit of a larger scale. So it starts out with three uh, areas, the prosencephalon, the mesencephalon, and the rhombencephalon. And that's going from top to bottom. The prosencephalon will in turn differentiate into two areas, which are known as the telencephalon and the diencephalon. Now, diencephalon, you might have heard of that term before, because that's what we call the hypothalamus and thalamus together. The mesencephalon doesn't differentiate into anything. And the rhombencephalon turns into the pons and the medulla. So I know that there's loads of terms here and they all sound the same. But the reason I've laid it out like this is so that you can see the equivalent lineages and the equivalent times of differentiation. So I'll just click this up. So like I said, the diencephalon forms, becomes the hypothalamus and the thalamus. And then also the third ventricle, which is the ventricle that sits in the middle and is found at the level of the hypothalamus and the thalamus. The telencephalon, as it's the highest up, that's what becomes the cortex. So your actual brain tissue that you think of as the brain, the cerebral cortex. Next up, next down is the diencephalon, which is the hypothalamus and thalamus. And then the mesencephalon, which you might have known as, which you might have heard as the, the midbrain. And then finally, the pons and the medulla. So as you go from left to right here, you go from more superiorly to more and more inferiorly. So just to look at that in a bit of a diagrammatic form, this is, this is when the fetus is only four weeks old. This is what it looks like. With the prosencephalon at the highest up, that will become the forebrain. The mesencephalon here, which will become midbrain. And the rhombencephalon, which will become, uh, we call the hindbrain. And then that will go down into the spinal cord. Just a little bit later, only one week later, you get that split into the next level that I showed on this previous slide, where the prosencephalon has split the telencephalon meaning the, and the diencephalon, meaning the thalamus and hypothalamus. And then this rhombencephalon is split into the pons and the medulla. And finally, just to show you how it develops, this is one, this is uh, eight weeks in, and that's when you start seeing it starts to look a little bit more like the shape of a brain. And you can see here the ventricular system. Now, I spoke in my last lecture a little bit about uh, CSF, cerebrospinal fluid. And cerebrospinal fluid flows within this ventricular system. So all of this is the brain and the, the ventricular system is split like this. In either cortex, there are the lateral ventricles and you can see them starting to develop here. They then flow down into the third ventricle, as in lateral ventricles are number one and two, and then into the third ventricle. And then they flow via the aqueduct, which is at the level of the midbrain, into the fourth ventricle, okay? And then you can see here now the cerebellum is also starting to develop. Okay, I just want to put in one uh, little slide here. I mentioned that in the last lecture, the, the use of glial cells and that glial, glial, glial cells have loads and loads of different functions. And one of their functions is to act as a scaffold in development for neurons. And this is just to quickly picture in your head what that might look like. So here during embryology, the glial cells literally, literally act as a, a scaffolding and they, they form much earlier than the neurons. And then the neuron is able to climb up the glial cell to get to where it needs to get to in the brain. And then that's the basics of the large, of the big picture stuff of uh, embryology. And then I just wanted to put this in to show you a bit about how it might be relevant clinically and why you actually why you need to know how things are formed. So there's obviously lots and lots of things on this slide. I don't think there are a few that I wanted to point out. Firstly is spina bifida occulta. You might have heard of spina bifida. And that's where 
the spinal cord doesn't fully close up at the bottom of your um, at the bottom of your spinal cord, and one of the vertebrae doesn't fully close up. It might be completely asymptomatic your whole life. You might have some hair growing here, might be the only symptom, but and that might develop. All of these issues may develop if the mother during pregnancy doesn't have enough folate in her diet. Folate's really important for um, cells developing because it's formed, it makes part of DNA. So a mother needs to take in lots and lots of folate for the child to be able to develop properly. So I definitely know that, that spina bifida is where one of the vertebrae doesn't fully close up, but the nerves stay within the spinal cord. And as you can see here, it can get, become more and more serious. So for example, the meningocele is where the layers of your meninges actually form a bulge outside of your um, vertebrae, but then the spinal cord stays within the, sp the, sp uh, the, ner the nerve stays within the spinal cord. And finally, the myelomeningocele, which is when the nerves are actually able to leave the spinal cord. And that's what happens if there's a failure of closure at the bottom end. And then all of these are what may ha happen if the, it doesn't close fully at the, the top end. And of course, these are of different levels of, um, of severity. So I know that's a lot of names, a lot of, a lot of things to, to talk about, but let's just see if, if any of that is stuck. So here's the first question. Oh, uh, it should have launched, it should have come up onto your screens. If it hasn't, let me know. Give you 10 more seconds for anyone who hasn't voted yet. Brilliant. End poll. So hopefully you can see the results now. Perfect that 94% of you put glioblasts and glioblast is the right answer. So remember that neuroepithelium forms the central nervous system cells and glioblasts are central nervous system. So they're astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. Whereas all of the other forms are from the peripheral nervous system. So that will be from the neural crest. And just one more question on this. Okay, Adam can't see the poll. It's popped up for most people. Uh, I'm not sure why it hasn't turned up on your screen, but it doesn't matter too much. We'll go, we'll go through the answer now anyway. So let's share results. And again, well done. The majority of you got that one right. Now this is, um, this is difficult because all the, all the names sound really similar. What I wanted to do by, by giving it in this tutorial is just make sure that you understand how it works and I'm afraid that this is one of the things where you are going to have to just go away and learn what the different names means. So here is the diagram that I had earlier. The telencephalon is the name of this very, very top bit here. And that's what will form the cerebral cortex. A few of you also put the diencephalon. The diencephalon is uh, a mixture of the thalamus and the hypothalamus. Okay. Great. So that is, uh, that's embryology done. We're going to be moving on now to, to blood flow within the central nervous system and also looking at strokes. Uh, this, this section gets a little bit more clinical because I think that when you're doing preclinical medicine, it's quite easy to get caught up on the science and forget why you're studying it. So if this is all stuff that you should still need to know, but um, hopefully it will be able to relate the science to what you'll need to know in clinical practice a little bit more. So hopefully you've seen this before. This isn't called the circle of Willis. 
And this is how blood is supplied to your brain. There are two, um, there are two main ways that the, the blood supply gets the circle of Willis, which is from these here, I'll click through the, I'll click through the blocks that are hidden in a second. These here, which form the vertebral arteries forming the basilar artery. And then also this, which is the internal carotid artery. So the internal carotid runs up your neck here on either side, whereas the vertebral artery is one from posteriorly up your back and then form the basilar artery running up your neck. Now this is really important because it means that there's two, two um, forms of blood flow to the, blade, to the brain. You obviously need a constant supply of blood flowing, flowing to your brain. So by having two forms, it means if something goes wrong with one of them, either the anterior supply, supply or the posterior supply, it makes you more likely to be able to still get the, the blood and the oxygen to your brain that you need. So just to go through the different names of this, there are lots of names. And I think it's probably quite important to know what they are because this is something that universities do like to test you on. But that said, because it's medicine, all of the names are quite uh, self-explanatory and they just describe exactly what they are. So here we have the anterior cerebral artery. And the important thing to remember with these is that these are bilateral. So you have the anterior cerebral artery on the left and the right, and that is connected by the anterior communicating artery. This here is the internal carotid. So that's the one that runs up your neck and supplies blood to this circle. And then you have the middle cerebral artery. We've had the anterior, so next we have the middle, and then we have the posterior. So again, all quite um, all named for in quite obvious ways. Uh, so we had the posterior cerebral artery here, and the communicating artery is what connects the middle cerebral artery uh, to the posterior cerebral artery. And this is formed from two vertebral arteries, which run up either side of your vertebrae and form one basilar artery here. Okay. So that is the main blood, that's the main blood supply to your brain. And the reason this is important is that you might get strokes or you might get cerebrovascular accidents in different parts of this supply. And that will affect how it presents and what symptoms the patient has. So you need to know the anatomy of it so you can then relate that to what you see in, in practice. Just very quickly, I wanted to talk about the venous drainage as well. Again, this can be quite complicated. There's lots and lots of uh, labels here, but I'm just going to point out the main ones that you need to know. So uh, the venous drainage is, uh, sorry about that. The venous drainage is, um, has lots of different parts to it. Firstly, there's the cerebral veins. And then there's also the venous sinuses. We spoke a little bit about the venous sinuses last time. The venous sinuses run between the two layers of the, of the dura. That is the periosteal labor layer and the meningeal layer. Um, and there's lots and lots of different venous sinuses. So it's important to understand how, how the blood flows through these sinuses and which direction they flow. So if you see here, you have the superior sagittal sinus, which runs right along the midline at the top of your brain as well as the inferior sagittal sinus, which also runs along the midline. Now these two travel to here. And this is, the main, this is the main part to remember, which is called the confluence of the sinuses. So blood will flow along here and along the inferior sagittal sinus through the straight sinus uh, to reach the confluence. Okay. Uh, once you're at the confluence, it travels um, at the confluence of the sinuses. It travels more anteriorly to the sigmoid sinus. Here's the label for that. And then it can enter to, to the jugular foramen. And that's where it can drain into your jugular vein. And your jugular vein of, runs down just next to your um, carotid artery, which is running upwards. Your jugular vein runs down bilaterally, and then that can get the blood back into your heart. So that's how you, that's how you get the link from the sinus system to the venous system. Okay. Next up, just a little bit about the blood-brain barrier. So this is obviously important because you don't want bad things getting into your brain. If you get a virus into your liver and you end up getting hepatitis, it's a bad thing. You don't want it, but you can survive. Whereas if you get viruses or pathogens entering your brain and your central nervous system, that can cause a lot more damage. So that means that the, um, the, the capillaries within the brain are much more regulated and much tighter. And this happens uh, with a couple of a couple of things make this happen. 
Firstly is pericytes, which you can see on the diagram here. And pericytes are really close to ca uh, capillaries and they, they just act as a physical block to stop things getting across the capillaries that you don't want to get across. So it's only within the brain that you have lots and lots of these pericytes, uh, which block it off. Then the second factor is end feet, which is these things here. And the end feet are part of astrocytes. We said that astrocytes have loads and loads of functions. And again, this just covers and surrounds the capillaries to stop things getting across the blood brain barrier that you don't want to get across. Then once you've set up this blood brain barrier, your capillaries will have um, lots of channels in them so that you can transport both in and out of the blood what it is you want, as opposed to having things just diffuse across randomly. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit more about strokes. Um, there, I think that stroke, there's lots of, there's obviously lots of things in medicine that have quite specific definitions. I think that stroke is one where the definition is quite important to learn the, um, the, the exact definition of it. And so that is a rapidly developing focal disturbance of brain function, a presumed vascular origin, lasting more than 24 hours. Lots and lots of words, I know it seems unnecessarily complicated, but all that means is that something's gone wrong with your blood supply and it's affected your brain, and that it lasts for 20, more than 24 hours. Now there are two main types of stroke, either infarction or hemorrhage. Infarction is where there's a blockage in your blood vessels and that stops therefore blood going downstream of that blockage. So therefore anything where is not, the blood supply is normally from downstream of that blockage, won't be able to get blood and won't be able to get oxygen. The other type is hemorrhage, and that's where a blood vessel leaks. And then the leaking of blood will stop your, will cause damage to your brain, either by not allowing oxygen to get to a certain area or by putting pressure on the brain, and that will also cause, uh, cause more issues. The most common type is definitely infarction, but it's important to know about both of them. Now, along with stroke, you have something called a TIA. TIA stands for transient ischemic attack. And it's very, very similar to a stroke. It, the only difference is that the symptoms last for less than 24 hours. So you might have the stroke symptoms and you go to, your, you go to the doctor, but by the time you've got there, it's, it's gone away because something has lodged and then it's been able to uh, be pushed through and carried on. And that's known as a transient ischemic attack. So just looking a little bit specifically at infarctions, there are two different things that can cause a blockage within the blood flow of your brain, either thrombosis or embolism. A thrombus is just another word for a blood clot, whereas an embolism is something that has traveled from far away. So that embolism might be that you had, um, you have quite a lot of atherosclerosis in your internal carotid arteries. And then because of that buildup of atherosclerosis, as the blood flows past it, it knocks a bit of it off, and then that travels up into your brain and causes an embolus. You may even get a thromboembolus, where you get a clot somewhere else in your heart, for example, and then uh, that clot gets dislodged from your heart and travels up through your circulation and gets lodged in your brain. So thrombus, if it's, if it's, if it's specifically because of clotted blood, and embolus just refers to anything. It could be, it could be a thrombus. It could be atherosclerosis, it could be fatty tissue. So next, we're gonna look at some risk factors for stroke. I was wondering if here, you'd be able to just on the chat function, private message me what you think might be some risk factors for stroke. So that's things that might make you more predisposed to stroke or more likely to get stroke. Let's see if the chat, just a private message chat function works. Brilliant, some great things coming through. I think you might, you may have got all of the ones that I've got on this slide as well. In fact, you're getting, you're getting even more than I had. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, so here's the list that I, that I came up with is the, is the key ones. The, a really important uh, risk factor that is often forgotten about is age which is that you're more likely, obviously, to get a stroke in a much older person than you are to have it in a younger person. If a child were to come in with um, neurological symptoms, stroke wouldn't be very high on your list of differential diagnoses. 
Whereas if it was an 80 year old, it would be much higher. Um, hypertension, which is high blood pressure and cardiac disease are also risk factors because that, they both will put more pressure on your, um, on your blood vessels. And cardiac disease in particular, there's a disease called atrial fibrillation and that increases the chance of blood clots forming in your heart, which as you said with the slide before, can then embolize and travel up to your brain and cause a, a, a stroke. Smoking narrows your arteries, so that will increase the chance that you get a, a stroke. And then also diabetes mellitus, which can cause, diabetes can cause damage to your blood vessels. Uh, somebody also put on the chat, somebody said uh, sex, so your, your gender, which is great, and males are, are more likely to get strokes than, than women are. Okay, now we're gonna look at where, where the stroke is. So we're gonna to relate to the circle of Willis image that we looked at before, and then see how that relates to the symptoms that you might get. So these diagrams here just show you where certain arteries, which area of the brain they supply. So just for reference, this is the front of the brain here, and here, and this is the back, the back of the brain, here and here. Uh, this is just looking from the middle of the brain, looking outwards, and this is from the outside of the brain, looking inwards. So firstly, looking at the blue area, that's the anterior cerebral artery, which we saw on the circle of Willis earlier. And that supplies the middle part here and the anterior part of the brain, as you'd expect the anterior cerebral artery, but also the, the midline of the um, parietal lobe as well as the frontal lobe. We went through some of this basic anatomy in the last uh, tutorial. So if you didn't watch that one, it might be worth looking over it. Next, we have the posterior cerebral artery, which is the green area in both of these. And that obviously is the posterior of the brain. And the important thing that you find here, this is the occipital lobe that it'll affect, and that's where your visual cortex is. And then finally, your middle cerebral artery, which its main function is the outside, as opposed to the middle, which is the anterior cerebral artery. It's the more lateral areas of the brain, both frontal, parietal, and parietal lobe as well as the temporal lobe here. So now just to look at how that might affect symptoms that you'll get. Firstly in the anterior coronary artery. This um, presents mostly in the leg more than the arm. Now we looked last time at, uh, it was called um, at the, at the primary motor and how there's an, it has a somatotopic uh, representation, which means that certain areas of your body are mapped out on certain areas of your brain. If you, if you didn't see the last tutorial, it'd be really worth looking at that and just to check uh, what that word means, somatotopic. And so the anterior cerebral artery, as we saw from the last slide, supplies the most medial parts, the most middle part of your brain. And so with this somatotopic arrangement, your feet are at the most middle part and at the top. And then as you go up your body, it's represented by further away and more lateral which is why an anterior cerebral artery infarct will affect your leg more than your arm. It will also affect your frontal lobe. I said last time the frontal lobe is what makes you, you. So it affects your intellect, your, your executive function, that's your, your higher order functions, and your judgment. And also loss of appropriate social behavior. So you might have somebody running through the street, uh, taking, taking their clothes off and not knowing that something's wrong because that's affected their, their frontal lobe. Next is the middle cerebral artery. And this is the more classic signs that you'll see on a stroke. Again, it's contralateral because your brain um, gives, gives function to the contralateral, the opposite side of your body. But in this one, you'll see it more in your arm than your legs and also in your face. Again, that's just looking at the somatotopic um, primary, som um, primary somatosensory cortex and the somatotopic primary motor cortex which means that the more lateral you get, the higher up your body it is. You'll also get hemianopia. This is where you can't see from one side of your um, eyes and aphasia, which is where you can't speak properly. And that's in particular with a left-sided lesion. Uh, that's just because of where the, the, the area of your brain that deals with speech is. But even that isn't for certain because for example, if you're left-handed or right-handed, that changes the probability that, that your speech center is in your left or right-hand side of your brain. And finally, you have the posterior cerebral artery. And like we said, this is in the occipital lobe at the back of your brain. And that's where the um, visual center is 
So this you'll mostly see with visual deficits. Homonymous hemianopia. Homo means same and hemi means half. So that means that on both sides, with both of your eyes, you can only see half of your visual field. Um, and but the same side is affected in both of your eyes. And then visual agnosia is being able to see something, but not recognizing what it is. And that's because of your um, visual center being in your occipital lobe. And that's what makes sense of the images and that you're getting into your brain. And then finally, I just wanted to quickly mention lacuna infarct. These are definitely much less um, important in terms of your understanding and much less frequent. But these are where you get small vessels being included much deeper into your brain. So it's not one of these main arteries, the anterior, middle or, or posterior cerebral artery. There's just smaller ves vessels and that can lead to really specific uh, deficits. So um, the symptoms aren't very easy to say what they are because it will depend where in your brain has been affected by this small, by this small occlusion. And for this one, hypertension is a really major risk factor for, to get uh, lacuna infarcts. One last little bit I want to talk about on strokes is hemorrhagic strokes. So we said 85% of strokes are ischemic, so these are much more common, but there are a few different types of hemorrhagic strokes that you might see. And what I've just put here is the really key things to look out for that will help you differentiate between one type of hemorrhagic stroke and another. So firstly, we have extradural. Extradural obviously is found outside the dura, and that is because of trauma. and um, and you'll immediately have, after, after the trauma, you'll immediately have the effects of the stroke. So often the, the frequent, um, so yeah, the, the frequent uh, presentation of this is if you get hit here, which is where a lot of the bones that make up your skull, um, they all join together here in an area called the terion. And your middle cerebral, your middle meningeal artery runs just below this. So if you get hit here, it's easy to fracture the skull and that can damage the middle meningeal artery, and that can lead to a stroke. Next, we have subdural, obviously below the dura, and these have delayed effects. So what this means is that you might have somebody who's playing a sport and they fall over and they hit their head, and they look like they, they're out of it for one or two seconds, they do become unconscious, but then they get up and they say, actually, no, I'm fine. And then over the next one or two hours, they slowly start to become worse and worse. And that's called a lucid interval, where lucid meaning that you're aware of things. So where you have the trauma, but then there is a bit of time because it's a much slower bleed because that's a venous bleed as opposed to an arterial bleed, which is what you'll see in extradural. Next, we have a subarachnoid hemorrhage. And this is more to do with hypertension because it's because of ruptured aneurysms. An aneurysm is where the most inner layer of a blood vessel gets pushed and forms a bit of a balloon and gets pushed through the outside layers. And these are really um, at risk of bursting basically. And that's when it ruptures. And then that will lead to a lot of blood being lost from that aneurysm. And then finally, again, less common is the intracerebral. And that's the equivalent of the um, lacuna infarcts that we saw on the slide before. And it's mostly just to lots of hypertension that will cause uh, a bleed. So that's all, that's all for strokes. So we're just gonna have a few questions. Let me just... Stick the poll on, just to see that we've, that's all made sense. If you have any questions, uh, is, the, is the poll coming on? If you don't have any questions, just drop, drop a message or use the Q&A tool. There, the poll should be on now. And just for this question, just to be sure, I mean the actual circle part of the, of the circle of Willis. Okay, I'll give you 10 more seconds. That's great. And uh, it looks like everyone's understood because 100% of people put vertebral artery and that's absolutely the right answer. The vertebral arteries run posteriorly up your vertebral uh, column and they're here and they form the bacilla artery. So these aren't, aren't actually part of the circle itself. So that's great. And then just one, 
one more question on this. Uh, let me just open it. And it should be live now. Give you 10 more seconds. And we'll stop it there. So brilliant. 95% um, of people got the right answer here. And that's the middle cerebral artery. So um, middle cerebral artery is the one that is the most classic stroke. You, may, you will have seen the adverts that say to act fast, where you look for the face, arms, speech, and then time to call 999. And that will be a middle cerebral artery. Um, again, just look, just look back at the slides if you did, if you, that didn't quite make sense. Um, you, the, the key to this is understanding what areas of the brain those different arteries supply. So then you can understand what damage that area would, would do in terms of symptoms. So just as a quick recap, just really quickly, anterior is more your frontal lobe. Uh, so you'll act a bit differently and your higher executive powers will go, as well as your feet more than your, your legs and your feet more than your arms and your hands. Middle cerebral, cerebral, cerebral artery is more your arms and your face, whereas posterior cerebral artery is more your um, visual cortex. And then you won't need to know, you won't really get a stroke and basilar artery very often. You won't, you won't need to know about that. Brilliant, so the, the final part of this lecture is very different from uh, looking at strokes. It's actually looking uh, a, lot, a lot more smaller scale um, and looking at specific neurotransmitters that we use. Again, in the, in the last neuro lecture, I spoke about how neurotransmitters work um, and just as a really quick recap of what they do, their job is to pass a signal from one neuron to the next neuron across a synapse. Um, and here I've just put in one slide to show you about loads and loads of different types of neurotransmitter and what they're made of. And I don't think you need to know this at all, but the point is that this is just a small collection. You'll have heard of a lot of these, and this is just some of the neurotransmitters that your brain and your, that your central and your peripheral nervous system use. Um, so, there's, so it's important to understand a bit about the key ones. So as I said, the, a neurotransmitter will um, transfer a signal across a synapse. And then once, it, once it's crossed that synapse and it binds the receptor postsynaptically, post -synaptically, there are two different things it can do. The majority, and when you think of uh, a classic neurotransmitter, what they do is they are excitatory. And that's where you want the signal to carry on between one neuron and the next neuron. And that will, um, that will increase the voltage. So therefore increasing the chance that you will uh, produce an action, action potential within that next neuron. And so that goes from your resting potential to higher. On the other hand, you may actually want to send a signal to the next neuron that you don't want it to depolarize. So to reduce the chance of it depolarizing, you send an inhibitory post, you produce an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. And that will actually, from your resting potential, make it more negative. So just in terms of what channels are, are doing this, the, the most common, i.e. excitatory, you want it to, to become from negative to more positive. So you open sodium channels so that an influx of sodium into the postsynaptic neuron can cause the um, signal to pass along the neuron. On the other hand, if you open chloride channels and get chlorides to enter the neuron, that will make it more negative and that will decrease the chance that that neuron then depolarizes. And there, there's within your central nervous system, there's a main type for each of these two responses. For excitatory, it's glutamate, and for inhibitory, it's GABA. I'm just gonna look a little bit more at each of these two. Um, so glutamate, as I said, is excitatory, and very a lot of these things, as, as I've said before, a medicine, it's, very, it's explained as to exactly what it is, it's named to exactly what it explains. So glutamate will bind to a glutamate receptor, and once it's bound to the receptor, you don't want glutamate to be within the synapse forever. Otherwise, it will keep trying to trigger the next action potential. 
So this is then uptaken by glial cells. We've said that glial cells have loads and loads of roles. We've seen three of them already today, and also presynaptically. And then once it's been uptaken by the glial cells and presynaptically, it means that it can't be um, activating the postsynaptic receptors anymore. Once it's been taken up, it's broken down by glutamine synth synthetase into glutamine. And that's just the basics about how glutamate works and then also how you stop glutamate from working. Next, we have GABA. GABA binds to the GABA A receptor. There's also other GABA receptors, GABA B receptor, for example, but these are found in different areas around the body and have different functions. The main one that you want to know about is the GABA A receptor, which you find in your central nervous system. Once it's bound to the GABA A receptor, again, it's taken up by glial cells and presynaptically, and it's broken down by GABA transaminase into something called succinate semialdehyde. I think that uh, these terms aren't too important to know, but I think what is important to know is the fact that it's taken up by glial cells and presynaptically. This is as opposed to, um, for example, acetylcholine, because acetylcholine, as we'll see on the next slide actually, is broken down within the synapse, as opposed to being taken up then broken down, it's broken down within the synapse and then taken up. So this is what the GABA receptor looks like. Again, this is, don't, don't worry at all about all the different parts of it, or um, I would probably know that it's got five subunits, but the point of me showing you this isn't to scare you about how much detail neuro can go into, because it can go into lots and lots of detail, but just to say that there's lots and lots of different parts of this GABA receptor that we can use and target pharmacologically to, um, if you want to affect the brain somehow. So you, I'm sure you have heard of a lot of these things such as uh, benzos, alcohol, um, convulsant sink, barbiturates, and that we can therefore target this GABA receptor, the GABA A receptor, for example, as an anti-epileptic because GABA is what is produces inhibitory postsynaptic um, potentials, which is what we saw before. So that works at calming the brain down because it's inhibitory as opposed to glutamate, which is excitatory. So if we try and trigger or increase the triggering of this receptor, we can use it to try and reduce the activity of the brain, therefore anti-epileptics, anxiolytics to reduce anxiety, sedative to send you to sleep, and also muscle relaxants. Okay, and then just the final thing I wanted to talk about for uh, neurotransmitters is to go into a little bit more detail about some neurotransmitters that you would have heard of, uh, acetylcholine, noradrenaline, and adrenaline. I'm not gonna be talking in this tutorial about um, where they're used, but you should definitely also know where in the body they're used and at what synapses you'll, you'll find them. So firstly, acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is formed presynaptically by the enzyme choline acetyltransferase, and it's acetyl and choline put together. Again, these names are really self-explanatory. It really helps with your learning. And as I said in the last slide, and that's, sorry, and that's all that is needed for acetylcholine to be made, just one enzyme to put two things together. And then once it's been released into the synapse, it's bound postsynaptically. It's then broken down within the synapse by an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase. Okay. So that's all you need to know for acetylcholine, two enzymes, one to form it and one to break it down. Noradrenaline, I'm afraid, is a little bit more complicated. It has a few different steps. The first step actually starts with tyrosine, um, an amino acid. And tyrosine is converted to dopa by tyrosine hydroxylase. The next step is uh, dopa produces dopamine. You would have also heard of dopamine. That's another type of neurotransmitter. Um, and that's by an enzyme called dopa decarboxylase. And then finally, dopamine is converted to noradrenaline by an enzyme called dopamine beta hydroxylase. Again, I know that there's lots and lots of names here, but you, you'll be getting these slides and then that can help you just to to go through and learn them, but I'm just here to try and help explain what's going on. And hopefully this makes it, by putting it out like this, it makes it quite simple, because you might have seen diagrams, and diagrams often have lots and lots of extra information you don't necessarily need to know about. A little point to make is that this final step occurs within a vesicle, and a vesicle is just a membrane-bound um, collection within the end of the neurotransmit, within the end of the neuron, sorry. So these first two reactions are just happening within the cytoplasm, plasm, and then once you've formed dopamine, 
that enters a vesicle to be able to be trans trans um, transformed into noradrenaline. Now, just to add a little bit more complication, if you want to turn noradrenaline into adrenaline, there is one more enzyme. It's called um, phenyl ethanol methyl transferase. I haven't put it into the slide because it's a really long name and too complicated, uh, but phenyl ethanol methyl transferase. And so for adrenaline, it undergoes all of these steps and then one more enzyme to convert it to adrenaline. And that's the synthesis of noradrenaline and adrenaline. So finally, just to talk about the breakdown, and this is for both noradrenaline and adrenaline. This, like we said on the, uh, in, this, like we said, is taken up, is taken up by cells as opposed to acetylcholine, which is broken down within the synapse. And this is taken by two different uh, receptors. Take it up, either MAU or COMT. MAU is found presynaptically, so it'll return back to the neuron that it was released from. And COMT is found on glial cells. Uh, and that's, that's just the transporter that's able to take it back up into the glial cells. And then once they're within those, back, once they're within those two cells, it can then be broken down um, into its parts that, it was, that uh, it was made from. So broken back down to tyrosine. Okay, lots and lots of names of enzymes and things there, but I'm just gonna give you one final question just to see uh, that it's all made sense. I'll launch the poll. And that poll should be open now. Give you 10 more seconds. There we are, we'll end it there. And 79% of you getting the right answer, which is phenyl ethanol methyl transferase. Just to go back quickly, that is actually the enzyme that's involved in converting noradrenaline to adrenaline. So that would not be involved in the production of noradrenaline. Okay, and that is the end. Those, I've, covered, I've covered the three different parts there. So embryology, um, the blood supply of the brain, and um, neurotransmitters. If you have any questions at all, please put them in the chat before, before, it's, uh, before we go off. The last slide is please do feedback form. It's really useful for me to help to give you more useful tutorials. Oh, sorry. Um, I've just got a quick question that is, will slides be given out at the end of the presentation or at the end of next week? Um, Connor, would you be able to answer that? Yeah, hi. So I, I'm not sure a decision has been made about this. I know that we've recorded all of the webinars. Um, and so it may be possible that we can make those webinars available. But it will probably be up to each of the presenters whether they want to share their material given that, is, that belongs to the various presenters. Okay, great. So yeah, a decision about when you'll be getting them will, will come out later, but I'll, but I'll make sure these slides get, do get out to you because uh, it's useful to look back on them. I've just had a, a, a couple of quick questions. Whilst I'm answering these questions, please do fill out that feedback form. Uh, so one is where does noradrenaline synthesis take place in the CNS? Uh, it's, a, it's a really good question because I looked at it on quite a small scale. I didn't actually, uh, mentioned on, the, on a bigger scale and so it's within this it's within the neuron that um, the noradrenaline is going to be released from so at the end of the terminal where the adrenaline is, noradrenaline is going to be released from so if that's within the CNS then it'll be in those cells and if it's within, within the PNS it'll be within those cells um, someone's asked how can it uh, how can a lesion in the right hemisphere causing, cause damage to the production of speech when Broca's area is in the left hemisphere? Uh, just give me one second to check. So it will actually be a lesion, I've, I, I put on the slides a left-sided lesion. So uh, it, you're right, you're completely right about Broca's area. Broca's area is to do with the production of speech and that's why a left-sided lesion is more likely to produce uh, some, some speech issues. So it's actually not on the right hand side, it's in the left hand side of the, uh, the left hemisphere. I hope that answers the question.
You've got a couple answers in the um, in the, the chat box as well, Chris, yeah. if you don't mind. Um, where does the ICA and vertebral artery branch out from? Okay, so um, your your internal carotid artery. Uh, there's obviously one on your left hand side and your right hand side, and they actually come from slightly different places. Uh, your right hand side one comes from off the arch of the aorta. You have the brachiocephalic trunk, and then that then turns into two branches. And one of those two branches is your right internal carotid, is your right common carotid artery. And then that common carotid then splits into internal and external carotid arteries. However, on the left hand side, there's no brachiocephalic trunk. It's just coming directly off the arch of the aorta. You have the internal common, uh, sorry, you have the common carotid artery. You also have the subclavian artery is the other one that goes off. Uh, and then that common carotid splits into the internal and the external um, coronary arteries, carotid arteries. With a vertebral artery, I'm not sure I'm, I'm certain on that, so I'm not gonna, um, I don't wanna give you the wrong answer, but it's, it's, it's really useful to know and I'd, I would look up where the vertebral artery uh, originates from. Somebody's asked that uh, there's the FAST acronym for MCA strokes. Uh, are there any other types of acronym for ACA and PCA? Um, so FAST is mostly just for, um, for, for people that aren't studying medicine. It's just something that's very simple to understand for, um, so that if somebody in public can, can spot it and they can really quickly get to that person to a doctor. Strokes are really time um, dependent. Because if you, have a, if you get a stroke and you determine that it's that you're, and you're able to treat it within a certain number of hours, it massively increases your chance of going back to, to normal function and improving how, how well you do afterwards. Um, there's no specific acronym for, for anterior or posterior. Um, with anterior, you would still get similar symptoms, which is the weakness and a, a loss of sensation. It's just more on your legs than, than your arms. And with posterior, it's mostly your, your vision. And yes, yeah, so there's no particular, there's no particular acronym there. Brilliant, that, somebody's answered that, oh, thank you. Uh, so then the vertebral arteries, I, I mentioned that off the, com, off the arch of the aorta, there's the subclavian and the common carotid. So the common carotid splits off into the internal and the external carotid, whereas the vertebral arteries will come off the subclavian. Yeah, I'll just quickly go back to this slide. You will, you will be getting these slides at, at, at some point. Uh, is this the one you wanted? So someone's just said to confirm the blood brain barrier contains uh, mainly two types of cells, pericytes and astrocytes. Um, so the um, so the, the blood brain barrier is formed from a few different things. Firstly, actually, is I mentioned this in my in my last neuro lecture, is the capillaries themselves. They're called discontinuous capillaries. So the structure of the of the capillary is different to minimize what is able to leak out. But on top of that discontinuous capillary, you have pericytes and and the processes at the end of astrocytes are the two main cells which help to add to that blood brain barrier. Yeah, they're, they're the two main types. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Chris. That was really interesting and very well presented. Thank you. If everyone could please fill out that feedback, um, I'll post the link one, one more time in the chat box. You can just copy it from the chat box and paste it into your browser. Um, it saves you having to write that out. Leave it, I'll just leave on this final slide for a bit as well. Um, thank you all for coming. I hope it's been useful. Uh, yeah. Um, one more question. So where do the other ventricles come from, lateral and fourth? Um, 
so the whole the whole ventricular system arises is it in the diencephalon too i'll just quickly go back to that uh, hopefully i can escape this just quickly go back um so the diencephalon is is not where the lateral ventricles and the fourth ventricle will arise from because that'll be at the um that'll be at the level that they're found so the lateral ventricles will be at the level of the telencephalon and then the fourth ventricle uh is at the level of the oh, it's, either, it's either the pons or the medulla so it's the it's definitely the, the rhombencephalon i'm not sure if connor if you remember what level that the, the the fourth ventricle is that oh here it is yes it's just here it just has the, the hind brain um so they'll develop they'll develop from their respective level that they're found at i hope that answers the question perfect well unless there are any more pressing questions um i think that's it from us today thank you very much chris and thank you everyone who's joined us today um don't forget that tomorrow 7th of May, we've got another one at seven o'clock. Great, thank you very much, Connor. Great, thank you. I'm gonna end the meeting now. Cheers. Thanks everyone. Bye.